there's a couple of themes to think about. First of all, serotonin works in a complex system. Okay, there's, there's degradation enzymes, there's transporters, there's different kinds of receptors. You can have different polymorphisms and different receptors that make your receptors either more active or less active, make your transporter less active or more active, make your degradation enzyme more active or less active. And then you also have serotonin interacting with all the other neurotransmitters. I mean, just in this discussion, we talked about dopamine, norepinephrine, glutamate, GABA, uh, acetylcholine. Okay, those are the ones we talked about. And that's a lot of neurotransmitters. So... The effects of serotonin at these receptors will influence the whole, uh, I don't know what the word to use for this is, but the whole microenvironment of your brain. Hello friends! Following along, along from the first part in this series on the ser serotonergic system, I'm going to today talk to you guys a little bit about the different serotonin receptors and some of the genetic uh, st the studies on the genetics that influence serotonergic activity in the body. As you'll recall from the first episode, which if you haven't watched, I recommend you go back and watch first. Um, I was, you know, one of the main reasons I was uh, hesitant to make a series on serotonin is I didn't want to be too detail-oriented and to push away the listener from learning some useful information. So I was planning really to skip the, the receptor part and especially the genetics part. But I do think there is some valuable information there that I can get to without being too detailed. So bear with me in this video. I'm going to, I have a, a few notes. I've tried to summarize some of the interesting things. And I'm going to try to tell you them so that by the end of the video, you have some understanding of the specific activity of serotonin at the receptors. Why would you want to know this? And the genetics. Why would you want to know this? Okay, that, let me tell you that first. So serotonin is a neurotransmitter. It's like a hormone, right? And the effect of the, the downstream effect of serotonin on systemically on a human being's behavior depends on the activity of serotonin at individual serotonin receptor subtypes. There are seven classes of serotonin receptors. Uh, they began to be identified in the 1950s. And the process, by the way, how this works, usually it's identified in a rodent's brain. And then eventually they clone the human um, receptor, at which case they know it exists in humans. And sometimes they identify the genes involved in producing that receptor. Okay, So there are seven classes of receptors. And each of those classes has subtypes. So some, well not each of them, but many of them have subtypes. So there's actually 14 subtypes of receptors. So for example, there's a 5-HT, that's serotonin. 1A, that's a, uh, the family 1 and the receptor subtype A, so, which is the first one we're going to talk about anyway. But serotonin has differential effects on, for example, the release of other neurotransmitters in the brain, as well as behavioral outcomes in both rodents and humans, depending on the individual receptors. So how are these receptors studied? They're studied by trying, usually, I mean, science, chemists or, sci or uh, anyway, scientists are usually trying to find um, molecules that are very selective in agonizing only those receptor subtypes that they're studying. Unfortunately, this is not always possible. So most famously, most uh, agonists of the 5-HT2A receptors also agonize the 5-HT2C receptors, and those receptors have opposing effects in, in many things, including... Uh, anxiety. So it's very tricky. But this exists for many, this, this problem exists for many serotonin receptor subtypes. This is one of the things, for example, that I'm not going to talk about in this video. And in reality, in my notes for my book, I have every single uh, molecule that agonizes, selectively agonizes any of the rece receptors listed, as well as the history of it and all that. So I won't get into that, but I want you guys to understand that that's how they're studied. And the reason why they're studied like that is because when you take this molecule that is not serotonin, that, for example, only agonizes the 5-HT1A receptor, you get to know what that receptor's, the agonism of that receptor does downstream. And by the way, what does agonism mean also, just for everybody to understand? So a receptor can be bound to by a molecule. This is called affinity. So some molecules can bind to a receptor. That doesn't mean that they affect the receptor's function. So some receptors can affect the receptor's function. I mean, some uh, uh, molecules can do that. And the way they do that is they either agonize it, which means they positively 
you, you could say positively modulated, but that gets a bit confusing. But they basically bind to it and positively cause downstream effects, okay? So, for example, uh, for example, like if we talk about another system, adrenaline ag uh, b binds to the beta adrenergic receptors and causes a downstream uh, increase in adenyl cyclase, which then causes uh, cyclic adenosine monophosphate, which by the way also happens with serotonin, cyclic adenosine monophosphate. But anyway, the point is, there are corresponding actions, right? So there's two ways to study this actually. Uh, researchers go and do something called a ligand binding study, where they do use assays to find out how much an individual molecule with what affinity it binds to that receptor. And then they do a separate test to check out the, the, the downstream effects. So when this binds to that, does adenyl cyclase change? Do you see what I mean? So if it changes, and that's a positive effect, then it's called an agonist. And if, if there is no effect, then that's called an antagonist. It blocks the activity there. And some molecules just bind to it. So basically what we want to know is what does agonism and antagonism Serotonin is always an agonist, but what does agonism and antagonism do, do to all of these receptors? And a second part of this discussion I'm going to have with you guys today in the same video is just very briefly, I'm going to discuss some of the outcomes of genetic studies on the different elements of the serotonin physiology in the body. Without further ado, let's get started. So first of all, I want to tell you guys that most of the serotonin receptors, except in fact all of them except one, are metabotropic receptors. So you guys may know this from the glutamate receptors. Many of the glutamate receptors are metabotropic receptors, but some of them are ion channel receptors. For example, the NMDA receptor, which we've talked about before in a previous video. So, and for example, nicotinic cholinergic receptors are ion, mostly ion, well, those are all ion uh, channels. So there's, most of the serotonin receptors are metabotropic, except for the 5-HT3. Now I'm going to begin, I have notes, so I'm going to be looking down a little bit just so I remember what to tell you. Uh, I'm going to begin with the 5-HT1 receptors, I'm going to go through all the receptor classes, and then I'm going to talk about the genetics afterwards, although I'm going to talk a little bit about genetics in between. This might seem a little bit detailed, but if you just listen to it, you'll, real, you'll get a, a flavor for what these things do. So first of all, the 5-HT1A receptors have an uh, A, B, D, E and F receptor. There's no C receptor. Notice that. The A receptor is the most well understood subtype of any serotonin receptor in the body. It is interesting because it's an autoreceptor as well as a heteroreceptor. An autoreceptor means that in the neuron that's communicating serotonin, this 5-HT1A receptor will be located on the presynaptic neuron, the one that's communicating. And it senses serotonin. So it acts sort of like a feedback mechanism to the body to tell the body, oh, you're producing a lot of serotonin, stop producing so much serotonin. This means that agonism of an autoreceptor can inhibit the synthesis or lower, attenuate the synthesis of the neurotransmitter involved. So this is sort of a, an interesting, uh, you know, I, I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. So one interesting thing about the 5-HT1A receptors is that beta blockers block, because of the structural similarity with beta receptors and the 5-HT1A receptors, beta blockers often bind to and block activity of 5-HT1A receptors. This is only one way in which beta blockers have serotonergic effects. There's a lot of uh, communication between the two, but this is one way. So the most potent beta blocker at blocking the 5-HT1A receptor is pindolol. But the other beta blockers, including propranolol, will do this as well. Of course, uh, hydrophilic, non-lipophilic uh, beta blockers like atenolol don't do this much. Um, so, at least in the nervous system. So another thing that's interesting about the 5-HT1A receptor is that its agonism releases growth factors. Now this happens for probably a lot of serotonin receptors. We know of at least two more probably. But it's particularly well known here, and in particular, the protein S100 was studied. Uh, now, its agonism, the 5-HT1A receptor, this is interesting to note, reduces obviously serotonergic activity because it's an autoreceptor, but it increases acetylcholine synthesis in the brain, and it increases growth hormone synthesis in the body, something you would not expect. Now, moving on to the 5-HT1B receptor, uh, 
This is very interesting. Agonism of the 5-HT1B receptor makes people less aggressive, or le makes rodents, let's say, less aggressive. The 5-HT1B receptor is also an autoreceptor and a heteroreceptor. It's less well understood than the 5-HT1A receptor. The interesting thing is that anti-migraine drugs target the, B the 5 ht one b receptor and the 5 ht one d receptor. Um, also, I should mention something very interesting. In mice that have a knockout, by the way, what a knockout is is this. You, you, you change a, the genes of a mice before it's born, and it's born missing a gene, and then you see its behavior. Now, these studies are a little confusing because... Growing up without a gene is different than having less activity of that gene as an adult because it could affect the way you develop. But in cases where the knockout gene study is associated similarly with an antagonist study in an, in an adult, you start to learn about uh, the behavior of that gene. So the interesting thing is that in knockout studies of rodents, the 5-HT1B receptor, when it's knocked out, makes a rodent get aggressive from the use of cannabis. And in adults, the same thing happens with uh, antagonism of the 5-HT1B receptor. Well, not antagonism, but genetic studies of adults show that certain polymorphisms at the 5-HT1B receptor are associated with aggression in response to cannabis use. So this is the kind of stuff I wanted you guys to learn, like how, how interestingly connected things can be. So uh, the, the 5-HT1D receptor is very similar to the B receptor. We don't know much about it. The E receptor is very little understood. The F receptor is also an autoreceptor, also very little understood. So this one's, I just want to show you guys how little we really know, huh? The 5-HT2 receptors are the, probably the second most important receptor class, or maybe the first, depending on how you look at it. The, they have three receptor subtypes, the A, the B, and the C. The reason why there was no C in the last receptor uh, class, the one class, is because the C, the C, the 5-HTC receptor was originally thought to be 5-HT2C. Sorry, receptor was originally thought to be the 5-HT1C receptor. So it's renamed, and then 5-HT1 has no C, which is why it goes to F. So anyway, agonism of the A receptor produces an anxiolytic effect. It also produces hallucination which is what you see with LSD and uh, drugs similar to that, like psilocybin, which is also what made researchers think that the 5-HT2A receptor may be involved in hallucinatory mental illness like schizophrenia. Interestingly, researchers tend to think that uh, some receptor will be involved in hallucinations if either a drug creates hallucinations from agonizing that receptor, like LSD, or if an atypical antipsychotic, or antipsychotic in general, that reduces hallucinations, antagonizes that receptor, which means blocks it. So that's actually how they come up with things, by the way. Anyway, the point is, so it does a anxiolysis, a anxiolysis, which means reducing anxiety. By the way, in the science terminology, uh, so anxiety, the root anxio is taken away from it, then it becomes anxiolysis, which means reducing anxiety. You could think of it also like uh, lipolysis is reducing fat. And then anxiogenic means increasing anxiety, or lipogenic means, or adipogenic means increasing fat. So genic means more, and lysis means less. So uh, agonism of the 5-HT2A uh, receptor increases anxiolysis, increases hallucinations, and increases transcription of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, one of the main growth factors for the brain, or for neurons in the brain. The 5-HT2B receptor is not very well understood. Its agonism also produces anxiolysis, means reduction in anxiety. The 5-HT2C receptor, which is also agonized by LSD and psilocybin, uh, is so the agonism actually produces anxiogenesis, which means increased anxiety. And its agonism inhibits the uh, transmission of dopamine and norepinephrine. And its antagonism increases non-REM sleep. Remember, in sleep, there's two portions, non-REM and REM. REM is usually the sleep portion that is the most fragile. It gets affected by drugs the most and so on. So agonizing the 5-HT2C receptor increases the proportion of non-REM, which means decreases REM, which is could be potentially due, it's probably due to other neurotransmitters downstream, potentially due to choline. Anyway, that's just speculation from me.
Um, so that's for the 5-HT2 uh, receptors. Let's go to the 5-HT3 receptors, and by the way, bear with me because everything else will be a bit uh, shorter, except for the 5-HT3. Uh, the 5-HT3 is a little bit longer. So, originally the 5-HT3 receptors were called the uh, M receptors They're in the 1950s. They were later renamed. Their structure is very similar. So remember, these are the ion-gated channels, uh, receptors. So these are similarly structured to nicotinic cholinergic receptors. The 5-HT3A uh, and B receptors form heteromers, which means they're joined together on the same neuron. And they often do so with the alpha-4 nicotinic cholinergic receptors. To learn more about nicotinic cholinergic receptors, watch the playlist. I'll probably link it here, which is my other series. Uh, all of the subunits con that have been observed so far contain the A version. However, so there's an A and a B. The B co-locates with the A often, I mean always. So there's either an A or an A and a B. But the C, D, and E are not well understood. And sometimes they co-locate with others as well. And the alpha-4 receptors from the nicotinic cholinergic receptors also co-locate. Which means all these receptors are together on a nucleus. Which means sometimes that agonism of the other receptor can cause a response in this receptor. So there may be, you know, sometimes that happens. So, more about the 5-HT3 receptors. First of all, they're found, well, I don't know where I should start. Um, first of all, they're found in high density in parts of the brain that are active in the process of vomiting, namely the nucleus tractus solitarius, the dorsal motor nucleus, this is a little detailed, but I just, and the area post -trema. So these are three areas in the brain that get activated when people feel like vomiting. In fact, what happens when people feel like vomiting is that the EC cells in the gut that synthesize most of the serotonin in our body release serotonin. At the same time, these cells in the brain also have serotonergic activity, and then vomiting happens. So some drugs have been developed to antagonize the 5-HT3 receptors to reduce what's called emesis or vomiting. For basically for people that are going through chemotherapy or have uh, you know severe things like that. So that's one thing that these receptors are used for, and it's really the main thing. But there's some other interesting elements. So first of all, agonism of the receptors, first, uh, or, sorry, let's, let's start with agonism. Agonism of the receptors increases dopamine transmission, increases GABA transmission, increases glutamate transmission, but decreases acetylcholine transmission, which is interesting, because they co-locate with the alpha-4 receptors. So it could potentially be that the alpha-4 receptor is acting as an autoreceptor of some kind for uh, acetylcholine. Uh, another interesting thing is that ethanol, is an, which is alcohol, is an allosteric modulator, a positive allosteric modulator of the 5-HT3 receptor. So what that means is that ethanol makes the receptor, this ion-gated receptor, more available for agonists to agonize it, basically. Uh, there's also, in terms of antagonism of the receptor, what we know is that it, the antagonism produces an anxiolytic effect, reduces anxiety. It reduces morphine and ethanol self-administration in rodents, but not cocaine, which is pretty interesting. I don't really know why. Could be because agonism of the receptor increases dopamine. So antagonism may reduce dopamine transmission, in which case... I don't know, it's, it's a little confusing. Cocaine is the most dopaminergic of those three drugs. Anyway, uh, point is, it's also, antagonism is memory enhancing, probably because it increases acetylcholine levels. And another interesting thing is that estrogen and progesterone are both antagonists of the 5-HC3 receptors, naturally. So, and by the way, this is an interesting concept. So, many people don't realize it's not just serotonin in your body that agonizes these receptors or antagonizes them. Many other molecules do. So estrogen's main activity in the brain is with the estrogen receptors, but it also has effects on other receptors. Or for example, dopamine. Dopamine's main activity is at the dopamine receptor, but it also agonizes the norepinephrine receptor. And the norepinephrine receptor probably does the opposite as well, although I'm not completely sure. So a lot of these things affect other receptors also. It's not so clean cut. Now we go to the 5-HT4 receptors. So, I'm sorry, I, I know this is a bit long-winded, but you can see how this is interesting because it associates different things that maybe people wouldn't realize are associated. So the 5-HT4 receptors, agonism of them increases transmission of acetylcholine, increases transmission of dopamine. Now, the acetylcholine is increased when the agonism is systemic, but if the agonism is local in vitro, means, meaning in a petri dish with you know, sliced uh, cells, dopamine transmission is increased, but not systemically. 
Um, and so agonism is also because probably because of the acetylcholine is memory enhancing and decreases the secretion of non-amyloidogenic um, precursor proteins. So basically there are uh, what's called soluble amyloid precursor proteins. So there are a couple of precursor proteins for amyloid synthesis and some of them produce beta amyloids whereas this the increase of precursor proteins here don't produce the beta amyloids that form the plaques of Alzheimer's disease. So basically it's slightly neuroprotective, the agonism of the 5-HD4 receptor. The antagonism of the receptor produces anxiolysis, which means reduction in, uh, in anxiety, and reduces pain, sensi uh, the, the sensation of pain. Now, the density of the, the 5-HT4 receptor is found in quite a high density in the nucleus accumbens, which is the main reward center of the brain. So it's thought that it may play a role in, in reward, but this is not completely clear yet. Now we'll move on to the 5-HT5 receptors. So the 5-HT5 receptors are the least understood of all. There, there is a 5-HT5A receptor and a 5-HT5B receptor gene, but the 5-HT-B receptor gene, 5-HT5B receptor gene, in the, in the humans is not actually, it's null, the gene. So it's not, the, the actual receptor is not available, but it is available in rodents, which caused a lot of uh, waste of time and research, uh, historically. Anyway, agonism of the 5-HT5A receptor causes an increase in exploratory behavior, and it's also thought that the LSD's agonism of the 5-HT5A receptor is what increases exploratory behavior in rodents and humans when they're on LSD. And potentially this receptor may be involved also in sleep. Almost finished, 5-HT6 receptor. I wanted you guys to know this receptor, along with actually the, um, a, the 5-HT1A and 5-HT1F receptors, the 5-HT6 receptor is only found in the central nervous system. Remember, 95% of the serotonin is outside of the CNS and there are receptors everywhere, which we'll get to when we get to our discussion about health, which is an important thing. But the point is, um, so it's only found in the CNS. It appears that it's involved in cognition and memory. Uh, there's one interesting thing about this, I'll mention in a second. Atypical antipsychotics appear to uh, bind to this receptor, which means they antagonize it, and so it could be, agonism of the receptor could be involved in psychosis. Uh, it affects the release of monoamine neurotransmitters like norepinephrine and dopamine, and GABA as well. Now one interesting thing about this is that this receptor has been identified both, uh, mainly through genetic studies, but otherwise as well, as being uh, involved in the uh, memory enhancing uh, behavior, the memory enhancing outcome that has come with calorie restriction in animals. So it appears that the 5-HT1, uh, sorry, the 5-HT6 receptor is involved in mTOR complex 1, which is called mTORC1, and it modulates its effect on memory from caloric restriction in a diet through mTORC1, which is really fascinating to me. Now, we're almost done. Bear with me. The last one is 5-HT7. The 5-HT7 receptor has A and B and D subtypes. Uh, it's not very well understood as well, but it has some interesting elements. So, number one, antipsychotics also have an affinity for this receptor, so it could play a role in psychosis, as most of the researchers think. Uh, there have been attempts, I usually don't mention the agonist, but I just want to mention here, Pfizer was trying to make an agonist of the 5-HT7 receptors, but failed because it's almost impossible to agonize the receptor without agonizing the adrenergic receptors. One interesting thing about this receptor is it is found in the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is the body's master clock. So it's very likely that it is involved in the modulation of circadian rhythms. It's also thought to affect learning and memory and schizophrenia and depression. But one interesting note is that there is a lipid called ole ole oleamide, oleamide, something like that. Oleamide increases, the availability of oleamide increases in the body as we get more and more tired. And it appears that oleamide is a, an allosteric modulator of the 5-HT7 receptors. So it may be modulating its effect on the suprachiasmatic nucleus by uh, 
uh, uh, positively allosterically modulating the 5-HC7 receptor. I've mentioned the allosteric modulation just a bit ago, if you guys remember. It means basically the ion channel, it's making the ion channel stay open more often, so it's more available for an agonist to come inside and bind or, you know. So finally, I want to talk to you guys briefly about the genes. Now, the genes most studied in regard to serotonin and behavioral effects in people are the MO, um, MAOA gene, which is the monoamine oxidase A, the COMPT gene, which is the catechol methyltransferase uh, gene, which I don't need to... So MAOA is a degradation uh, enzyme that degrades serotonin, we mentioned in the first video. When the serotonin is not uh, made into uh, melatonin or it's not taken by the transporter back into the presynaptic uh, new, um, neuron, it is sometimes degraded by monoamine oxidase. So monoamine oxidase polymorphisms are extremely well studied in regard to behavior and have a lot of results. COMPT is an enzyme that it's not related to serotonin, but it's an enzyme that methylates norepinephrine and dopamine, and it's also very well studied. Other than those two, the most studied polymorphisms, well, I think, yeah, other than those two, uh, regard the serotonin transporter. So there's two genes that are very frequently studied. One is SLC6A4, which regards the transporter, and one is uh, 5-HTTLPR, which is 5-HTTLPR is... PR is the promoter of the serotonin transporter. So this gene is outside the serotonin transporter gene. It's located in the promoter region of that gene. And this gene is surprisingly important, extremely important. So I want to tell you a little bit about the promoter region of the serotonin transporter. Basically, this is what's been discovered. And all of my cognitive enhancement uh, package uh, 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 you know, clients have, have all had theirs analyzed. You can have yours analyzed too. If you have your genes, you can go look up how to analyze it through a couple of SMPs to approximate because unfortunately 23andMe and these guys don't actually uh, analyze the right um, SMPs, which is ridiculous, by the way, because this is one of the most impactful genes in the human body, at least to cognition. So anyway, the important thing is that there are a couple of variants of this promoter. They're called the long variants and the short variants. Now, the long variants have two versions also. One is called the L subscript A, which is truly long. And there's one that's called the L subscript G. The LG acts sort of like the short variant. Basically, what happens is the short variant and the LG variant are inefficient genes that cause less transcription of CERT. The outcome of this is that the people should have reduced CERT activity. But the actual outcome in terms of their behavior is what you would associate with more CERT activity. So let me describe. What it's been associated... Well, first of all, let me mention something. There is a huge ethnic difference in the proportion of long or efficient and inefficient CERT promoters. Africans have the most long promoters. And then uh, the, the, the people who have the, among, among, so after Africans, there are Caucasians. And then after Caucasians, there are uh, Latin Americans. And then after Latin Americans, East Asians. East Asians have the most inefficient uh, promoters. And Africans have the most efficient. So put it in that way. So, and also, be, because these things are all polygenic, Sometimes, the effect of the long allele will be different in an African than a uh, Asian, for example. So, for example, a uh, short allele is associated with substance abuse among Asians and whites. But in Africans, it's, it's all, the long allele is associated with substance abuse because of polygenic interactions. Anyway, what I wanted to tell you guys is that the low expression version, which is the short version or the LG version, is associated with, I'm not going to cite this because there's, no, there's not going to be any space because I'm going to list a lot of genetic stuff right now and there's just no space to cite it. But if you guys have questions, I can provide papers. So uh, it's, it's associated with suicide, PTSD, 
a greater amygdala response in re, uh, a greater amygdala response in response to a stressful stimuli, a greater cortisol response in response to a stressful stimuli, substance abuse in non-Africans, um, not depression. Interestingly, despite many studies trying to associate it with depression, it's not associated with depression. It's associated with more loss aversion and less risk taking in gambling tests like the Iowa gambling test. It's associated with susceptibility to decision framing. Now, for those of you that haven't studied decision science, decision framing is the architecture, what we call choice architecture of a, of a decision. So sometimes the wording, sometimes the order of choices that you have, sometimes the default. So if you want to read more about this, you should get a book called uh, by Thaler and Sunstein called, uh, well, I'm forgetting the name right now, but just search Thaler and Sunstein on uh, on uh, Amazon, you'll find the book. It's called Nudge. It's a great book on choice architecture. Anyway, people with the short or inefficient, generally, alleles are uh, more susceptible to the framing of a decision, which means they allow uh, things that are that should not rationally impact your decision, such as, for example, the default choice. So, for example, in one country, so, for example, in Scandinavian countries, it's common that if you go to the DMV there, their kind of DMV, if you don't, like elect to uh, not donate your organs, the default in the country is to donate your organs. So you have to go to the whatever their place is, I don't know, it's not a DMV obviously, and tell them, I, I don't want to do it. So it's called an opt-out decision. Whereas in the US, for example, if you want to donate your organs, if you happen to die, you have to go to the DMV and opt in. So what ends up happening is most of the people in opt-in countries opt, uh, don't opt in. And most of the people in opt out countries, uh, don't opt out, which means most people favor the default choice in their country. This has been shown because there are some countries with similar cultures, for example, Scandinavia that have different uh, policies. And so these people that have the short allele or the LG allele are more susceptible to this kind of, you know, illogical, uh, suggest, uh, suggestibility, I guess, by your choice architecture. So, uh, finally, I want to mention uh, it's also associated strongly with obsess obsessive compulsive disorder. Now, other than this uh, promoter region, I'm not going to get into monamine oxidase because that involves many other neurotransmitters. Same, the same for COMPT. I'm not going to get into the actual CERT, uh, CERT which is SLC, that, that gene, because this is too much details. I know people are not going to find it useful. But I do want to list for you guys some of the things that are statistically significantly associated with polymorphisms that people have at the receptors that I just mentioned. So these receptors all have genes and these genes, let me just explain briefly what a polymorphism is. So in these genes, you have four kinds of, think of them as letters, because that's how you see them on 23andMe. You have four kinds of letters that can be available there. What happens in humanity is that there is what we call generally, and of course there's no single one, but we call something an ancestral variant, which means at an individual single nucleotide, you will find two letters, okay, which correspond to programming instructions. And those letters could be a variety of letters. They could be from four letters. One of those letters was your ancestral variant which means that originally, at some time frame, there was, say for example, uh, an A, okay? And then what happens every so often, quite rarely actually in humanity, there's a mutation in which instead of coding for that letter, someone is born coding for another letter. When that happens, usually the person quickly dies because of a genetic illness. But when that doesn't kill them, it enters into the uh, gene pool of humanity. And then what happens is evolution either selects for it or doesn't. So you can think of it this way. Like, for example, the, the famous uh, genotype APOE4, which affects cardiovascular disease and Alzheimer's disease, it's considered maybe one of the worst uh, gene variants someone can have that is not automatically lethal when they're young. So it really impacts people's health. Uh, very hard to live a long time when you have the APOE4 variant. There is also an APOE3 variant and there's an APOE2 variant. The APOE4 variant is the ancestral variant. The APOE3 variant started about 150,000 years ago and the APOE2 variant started around 90,000 years ago. 
The ApoE4 variant, you would think, well, why did we select for the other ones? Well, what happens is the ApoE4 variant is actually very useful in fighting the body off, I mean, helping the body fight off bacterial infections and things like that. But it also causes the body to be in a more inflammatory state in general, uh, what's called a REL-A dominant state. The ApoE3 variant does that less, and the ApoE2 variant does that even less. These are mutations that caught hold because they are more helpful for us in our current lifestyle where we eat cooked food, for example. We don't eat raw meat anymore, so we don't really need, for example, the ApoE4. Someone following the primal diet should probably check if they have an ApoE4 variant. I mean, there are many other things that could influence their immune system, but that's one, one example. So, basically, at each of these serotonin uh, genes, you can have different variants from mutations that, that were not pathological that came into the gene pool. So you may have at the promoter region a short allele or a long allele. Uh, I, I believe that the, sh the long allele was ancestral, but I'm not completely sure off the top of my head. So what I wanted to tell you guys is not any details, and I'm not, as I said, I'm not going to cite this because I'm going to say it too quickly. There won't be enough time to put all the citations here, but I just want you guys to know the kind of things associated with polymorphisms at the serotonin receptors. So, I'm just going to go through the list in no particular order. Panic disorder, suicide, aggression, addiction, uh, antidepressive response, which basically means respond to, response to things that inhibit uh, CERT, uh, ADHD, uh, osteoporosis, interestingly, one of the serotonin receptor subtypes, uh, depression, sleep apnea, which is also interesting, schizophrenia, pain, impulsiveness, cortisol response, bipolar disorder and mood disorders in general, migraines, and Alzheimer's disease. Of course, I have citations for any of these, so if you have questions, you can just ask about, about anything uh, that I didn't cite in the video. So now that I'm done talking about this, and I know this video is actually, I think it's been over a half hour, so uh, I do apologize for the length, but I hope you guys got an understanding of, a, like there's a couple of themes to think about. First of all, serotonin works in a complex system. Okay, there's, there's degradation enzymes, there's transporters, there's different kinds of receptors. You can have different polymorphisms and different receptors that make your receptors either more active or less active, make your transporter less active or more active, make your degradation enzyme more active or less active. And then you also have serotonin interacting with all the other neurotransmitters. I mean, just in this discussion, we talked about dopamine, norepinephrine, glutamate, GABA, uh, acetylcholine. Okay, those are the ones we talked about. And that's a lot of neurotransmitters. So... The effects of serotonin at these receptors will influence the whole, uh, I don't know what the word to use for this is, but the whole microenvironment of your brain. So your serotonin signaling is affecting your dopamine signaling, it's affecting your adrenergic signaling, it's affecting your GABAergic signaling, which is the main relaxing inhibitory neurotransmitter system in the body. And it's responsible for like 40% of the inhibition of the whole nervous system. And your glutamate signaling. Okay? So... It really affects a lot of things. The other thing for you to think about is that we know that, first of all, we don't know very much about the receptor subtypes. We know the most about the 5-HT1A receptor, and we know a lot about the 5-HT2A and C receptors, and we know a little bit about the 5-HT7 receptor, or 6 receptor, and a little bit about the, five, uh, the 3 receptor. But basically, a lot of what we know about the receptors is still limited. And, and the reason why is, is that there's differences between rodents and humans, and it's very hard to study this in humans. And also, to be honest, it's, it's literally a chemistry problem, which is that we don't have molecules that are selective enough at these... I mean, think about it. Like, you know, this is why at my age now, I've come suddenly to really admire chemistry, and, uh, you know, I wish there was more interest in people going into chemistry, because we need to find... So for example, here, we can't agonize some of the receptors by themselves, so we can't learn what they do in, in, in vitro, in petri dishes, which is an important element of learning what a, how it, something works. Because then, instead of just increasing serotonin in the brain, you can agonize individual receptors in a selective manner, you know what I mean? So that's, that's one thing, but, but there's even more problems. Like I may, may have mentioned this in the previous video, but so... Remember, serotonin is produced, maybe I'll get into this in more detail later, but serotonin is produced by the tryptophan hydroxylase 2 enzyme in the brain. There's no drug that I know of that increases the availability of tryptophan hydroxylase 2, which I wish there was a drug. This is a very interesting thing to do, you know what I mean? 
So because of limitations with pharmacological stuff and because of the difference between rodents and humans, we don't know that much about the receptors. But what we do know is that aside from affecting uh, basically uh, anxiety, uh, memory and concentration, um, some things you wouldn't expect like uh, osteoporosis, vomiting, um, migraines, and um, okay, those are basically the general fear types. So it affects, they affect the signaling effects of few different things that we wouldn't really expect, and some things that we would expect, like anxiety and hallucinations, I should mention also. So it affects a lot of different kinds of things. Now, this, I promise, will probably be the most boring video on the series, but it's important for you to get a flavor of how complex and interrelated all of the different serotonin receptors are and how they may function and so on. So we'll get on to the next topic in the next video. I have no idea that what that will be yet, but I will talk to you guys soon. Have a great day and I'll see you soon.